Hi, and welcome to a Fizz 101.1 video cast. My name's Kevin Pimblett, and as usual, I'm joined by Tim Peterson. Hi, Tim. Good day, Kevin. So, one of the things earlier in the semester that a lot of students were posting on in the discussion forums was this concept, this idea of entropy. And actually, a few students emailed me privately on right. top of that as well, asking us to discuss what the hell entropy was and mm. how to explain it to the students. So, to my mind, entropy is a measure of disorderness, but mm. I guess that's quite a glib statement, really. What do we mean by that? Yeah, well, we have to characterise order in, in some way, and we've got a demonstration for that. Um, on top of the, what you said, it, it's quite an exotic concept. If, mm. if we go through the textbook night and look for instances of entropy, it's sort of sprinkled throughout the book. And it, it's uh, quite a sophisticated uh, concept, would you say? Yeah, I'd agree, and it's certainly one that is built upon in higher year levels in a lot more detail mm -hmm. than we're going to do in first year. Maybe we could go to the demonstration, Tim. Now, you've got a tray next to you, and maybe you could put it just over here on the bench. So, as you can see, what we've got here is a tray, and it's full of little uh, ball bearings, small metal ball bearings. In fact, there's two plastic ones scattered somewhere in the system as well. So this is our system, and we've got a whole load of ball bearings. I'm not sure how many there are, but one way we can think about disorder is potentially how we could organize all of these ball bearings into some sort of arrangement. Yes, and you can see that's what we've done here. If we, if we look at these balls, um, we've got little hexagons here, and we, we would say that these are in a close-packed arrangement, similar to how a grocer arranges their oranges. But this is quite interesting just looking at this anyway, Tim, because I can see here, for instance, in this arrangement, that there's kind of a discontinuity. Uh, in, in the regu regularity, that's right. Yeah, that's right, and there's, there's gaps a, there's as gap. well. Uh, it doesn't look evenly distributed, and here mm. it's not closely packed at all, mm. although here it's beautifully kind of hexagonally packed. Why does this happen? It looks like it's spontaneously created some sort of order with a few defects from nowhere. Yeah, so um, the, we, we would say this regular arrangement is, is uh, something like a crystal if these balls were atoms. A crystal, la crystal lattice. Yes, that's right. And places where an atom or a ball is missing, we would call that a point defect. Places where the crystal terminates over here, we'd call that, say, a grain boundary in a crystal. And this is a naturally occurring phenomenon. That, that's right. Um, imagine these balls were uh, atoms of, of water, H2O. Uh, we, we wouldn't expect um, spontaneously for the water in the pond uh, just nearby to uh, suddenly order itself regularly into a crystal because then the pond would be frozen. The other way that I think about this is it's quite improbable that all the water would suddenly be on the west side of the lake That's spontaneously right. and nothing on the east side. That's right, it, it could happen. It, it is theoretically could it happen? possible, it's just very improbable. I think <laughs> when you say it could happen though, it's going to take the longer than the age of the universe to happen. That's right, I, I don't think we've got that much time on this video. To no, I don't think so. Uh, and we can say the same sort of thing about this though, there's a certain finite number of arrangements we could make with these mm. billiard balls, um, mm. ball bearings, sorry, not billiard balls, yeah. but it's a very, very, very large number. That, that's right. Um, so, so let's make some other arrangements and okay. uh, we'll do this in, in a random fashion. We'll try to simulate the effects of temperature and let the balls bump into each other in, in, in an ad hoc manner. Okay, so do you want to inject some temperature into the yes, system? So so Tim, you've injected energy into that system, what's happening? So what we see is that we've got a natural tendency for uh, disorder here. So uh, we've gone to a more, say, probable configuration. When of, you say uh, more probable, you just mean that disorder is highly likely compared to a crystalline lattice structure? That, that's right, yeah, because these balls could go anywhere. Um, ignoring the fact that they bump into each other when they get dense. And so it's quite unlikely that they should all be in the corner if we were just to randomly shape this. And, okay, uh, do it again then. Let's, let's do it again. Okay. There's another configuration. So we've got a few pairs in the middle, we've got a lot around the outskirts, around yeah. the edges. And the ones around the edges seem to have naturally ordered themselves, and there's a few in the middle now. 
That's right. So we've got this idea that a more disordered state is more common or more likely perhaps. Yes. Um, and this leads us to the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, in, in a closed system, the entropy always increases. So this idea of entropy then means disorder. So entropy tends to disorderedness and disorderedness tends to a maximum over time. Yes, yeah, that's right. So how do we get more ordered then over time? Because we've got things clearly in a crystalline lattice structure which well, seems to me to be a more ordered state. Yes, well, I mean, this is a, uh, this is a closed system, but we could uh, do some work, say we could introduce more balls uh, and, and watch it become ordered. Okay. So we're doing some work here. We've got an open system because the container has its own universe and I live outside of that. I'm grabbing balls from a different container and and putting them in, we're increasing the density of the system. So we've got more balls per unit area in the container. We actually have a range of different balls here, but it doesn't matter for the sake of the argument. So what have we observed here, Tim? So we might think of this as what happens when a liquid which has a disordered arrangement of molecules, such as H2O, um, cools down in the density. So when it turns to ice? Yeah, when it turns to ice. Um, what we see is a, a transformation from something which was disordered to something which is, which is quite ordered. Hmm. If you look at these regions here, we've got very regular arrangements of the balls. Now you uh, said earlier, Tim, that uh, an experiment was done with a couple of different balls, and we've got uh, a few clear balls in here. When we were doing it earlier, we had just two of them contained inside. This is an experiment done by Dubai, was it not? Yeah, that's right. And um, I mean, you, you've talked about phase changes in, in class, I believe. Is that, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Transitions from gas to water, water to ice, and latent heat, and those concepts. And we, we've been talking about order. And when you think of a liquid, and uh, molecules in a liquid, you might think that there's no order there. And so then you think structurally, how is that different from a gas? Because you know about ideal gases. And they're very uh, mm. disordered in terms of the positions of the atoms. But even in a liquid, there, there is structure. Uh, if we take some of these out, for example, lower the density. We can get a bit more disorder to get an arrangement of balls that we might see in something like molten metal. There's a bit more disorder there. But there's still some order. There's in some the order. Yeah. And we can, we can characterize the order in terms of correlations uh, rather than regular arrangements, which we don't have. So we could say pick two balls, say this clear one and this clear one, and measure the distance between them. And we could just keep doing that for different shufflings. Or if the system was really big, we could just keep picking out pairs. And Dubai did this to his students. Every time they came into his office, he gave, he had them give it a shake and measure the distance yes, that's, between that's, the two. That's the folklore in a book by uh, Lawrence Bragg. Uh, that he got his students to measure the distance between the balls over and over again, every day for a very long time. And they built up a histogram of those distances and that uh, informed them about the correlations between pairs of, of balls. And, and this was used to uh, understand the structure of liquid mercury at the time when they were doing X-ray uh, scattering experiments upon that. Wow. Yeah. So I think the final thing that we want to mention is just one equation for entropy, and that is the dQ, the change in heat, Q, mm. is T, the temperature, times dS, the change in entropy, which is labelled S. And yes. so that leads us to the units or dimensions that S, the entropy, has. Yeah, so um, just verbalising what you said, um, the change in heat, dQ, is tedious, uh, which is a, <laughs> a crummy physics joke, and there are many of those. Uh, temperature times um, 
change in entropy. So if we reshuffle that in our minds, um, entropy has units of joules per Kelvin. Is that right? Joules per Kelvin? Yes. Okay, uh, I think we're going to leave it there for today. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. I hope that gives you a brief insight and overview to the concept and idea of entropy. We'll discuss this a little bit more in our first year classes. And as you get to second year, we'll go to the origins of that equation, that dq is TDS, in a lot more detail. See you next time. Thank you. See you.